That's right. This is the Pre-Game Engineer Tailgate Mayor Racing Podcast, episode number 56 for Tuesday, July 26, 2016. I'm Tailgate Mayor Rusty Wallace, joined as always in the PETM Podcast Studio by Pre-Game Engineer Andrew Sherwin. we got a few cobwebs on the seat today, man, but we're shaking them off, ready to I go. I tell you what, it feels like I haven't done a podcast in like three months or something. Like, did we just start? <laughs> did we start over? Did we, we have to start renumbering? The rebirth here. We're the phoenix rising up from the ashes we didn't take this much time off in the off season i know we didn't didn't, didn't feel didn't. like i've been on vacation i uh, did some hiking in switzerland with our esteemed producer the frizz 11 and sherwin took his little vacation over to denver colorado yeah i went and to had the, himself a time denver uh went to a rapids game with my sister and her buddies and her my future brother-in-law aha uh-huh. as well, i refer to him now congrats uh, to the sister then Went to the Rapids game on Saturday and the Braves game on Sunday. The Rapids game was awesome. I like how it's the Braves game. You went oh, to the hell Braves yeah. Game. <laughs> I didn't go to the Rockies game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Somebody has a big old outside bar to the east side of Denver, and the Braves were playing that day. That's right. So, the Braves didn't score a touchdown like the other team. Did, though, so. <laughs> well, that'll happen. That'll happen <laughs> with the Braves this season. Anyway, if I remember how this podcast goes, we usually start with uh, what you drink. <laughs> that is usually how we start. That's right. Um, so I will start by saying I'm drinking the local Sweetwater IPA that we, uh, it's almost it's a made, staple of the fridge, really. Yeah, it's made an appearance several times on the podcast here. I was trying to remember if my beer has made it on the podcast yet. It's a New Belgium Citradelic Tangerine IPA. I know I've drank uh, I one of like them. I feel like we've discussed it, but maybe it was the Sculpin. Yeah, I've had the grapefruits the and the other point. ones on here. I'm just all into these fruity beers now. I don't know if I should be uh, embarrassed or happy or what, but well, boy, these are tasty in the summertime yeah. when it's whatever it is, 100-something degrees outside in Atlanta here. Yeah, if you're supposed to be embarrassed, then I am too because I love them also. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, really, they all remind me uh, like that refreshing taste of Noble Pills, mm-hmm. but they may have a different little bit of flavor nuance. But they all have that like kind of nice body, but really not a heavy beer. Yeah, and then the fruity, hoppy, all that stuffs. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if you're listening to the podcast, always be sure to join us on the Periscope. I saw somebody asking there about uh, Dale's Pale Ale. Sure, have had that. Uh, it's a little chewy. I uh, had it but it's yesterday. <laughs> sure, one's had it <laughs> recently, as it turns out. Well, we uh, we're on episode number fifty six, and therefore uh, one of our segments is always talking about the car number that goes along with that and 56 i mean i think true x when i was looking it up he he ran 144 races in the number 56 driving the number 78 now which was that it i think you said 144 104 144 i believe okay okay that sounds about right yeah and uh of course his uh that you were talking about it when you and i were talking earlier that that was his daddy's number and all that and there's a good story behind it but i think we shelved that story until we get to maybe the 78th episode and talk about the number 78, because I found out about a fella who I just had to tell the possible. Yeah, about. let's do it. Let's do it. I warned a couple of guys that were wanting to do the number uh, number suggestion, the historical stuff. Uh-huh. And I said, hey, man, Rusty usually does a really good job <laughs> of digging something up, so we're so, going to let him keep doing that until – you know, until you start sucking. Dug up an old fella <laughs> named Bill Morton. He's from Tennessee. He drove NASCAR and a ton of short track stuff uh, back in the 50s and 60s. He only had 35 starts in NASCAR, 15 of them in the number 56 car for the 56 episode. But the thing that struck me the most, unofficially, he holds the record among any driver for being banned from the most racetracks. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a guy I want to have a beer with. That's right. Uh, he, uh, he came to fight. If you... Uh, if you touched uh, his fender, you were going to get your ass whooped after the race. <laughs> that's just how it came down. You were, hey, everybody does it different. It. <laughs> yep. you got to do it your way. He had his first NASCAR race in 1955. He flipped the car, went over the guardrail, flipped the car, and drove it home afterwards with no windows and no uh, front or rear window. I guarantee he drove it to the, the race. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, funny story with him, uh, he went back to Newport Speedway. He won 28 races in a row on the short track. Oh, that's awesome. The track put a $100 bounty on his head, then put a $200 bounty on his head, and he said, hey, if you're going to put bounties on my head, if I win, then you got to give me half. And they said, okay. And he won more money that year in 1971 than he's won in any other series, any other year that he's ever lived. Because he won like 12 races and beat up 75 dudes. <laughs> yeah. 
at a hundred dollars a clip. Uh, old Bill Morton, he passed away in two thousand one, but the legend lives on. God bless him. At the PTM podcast, we're raising our drinks. Goodness gracious! To old Bill Morton, I I saw a, a interview with his son uh, in some paper. I'd love to see if I can find that dude's Twitter address or if he's on social media anywhere and tell him to listen in and and hear that his dad's still living on in infamy. I mean, uh, for around. sure. What a guy. Uh, and that brings us to our uh, update on Kenny Smith, the Kenny Smith 24K PTM podcast car out there in Iowa, usually at the uh, Lee County Speedway there in Iowa. Uh, but he went over to Burlington, Iowa on Saturday, and uh, he ran ninth. And so he, he had dropped back to 15th, he said, due to driver error. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your honesty. Uh, yep, yep. But uh, raced it back up and fought back up to get in ninth place. Kicked 12 people's asses and then everyone, <laughs> oh, no, I'm just messing. <laughs> he probably could. Uh, oh, yeah, I guarantee. Uh, uh, Marine Corps Sergeant Kenny. Uh, he's running his second car now. We kind of uh, missed that while we were on vacation there. So Yeah, he's got I that think I kind of saw it awesome. was going to happen. And he'd gotten another partner mm-hmm. uh, that allowed him to finish that car. Uh, it sounded like the motor in the orange one was pretty sour. He can confirm or deny. But uh, I'm glad he got the green one up and running. It looks good. Yep. Not yep. that I didn't like the orange one, but, hey, it's always good to have options. Absolutely. So follow him at USMC Kenny SGT. See what he's doing next time with the PETM podcast car. So that's our intros, man. Now we get to talk about so all the ho- stuff we've ho- missed. Oh, yeah. Hold ahead. on just a second. While we're on that note, I'm, in- <laughs> yeah. I'm injecting ad lib. So one of the series that ran at Dixie mm-hmm. was... That's right. You went to the local track this... Was uh, Kenny's last... class. No kidding. And I was like, Kenny! <laughs> Where are you at, buddy? <laughs> I didn't think to get my phone out. I'd had one, two, three, four uncountable amount of wobbly pops at that point. Because <laughs> it was late in the... It was after the open wheels... Uh, and like maybe in between the late models and the super late models. I don't know. It was, it was an awesome program, but I, the first thing I saw was, Hey, that's Kenny's class. <laughs> that's so awesome. Hopefully he'll make it down here someday and we'll be there. That's awesome. Uh, let's see. So that brings us to our, finally back to our normal segments. Let's do this. Let's tear it down. Let's tear it down. We're tearing it down. I think the first thing we have to tear down, I mean, we've missed, uh, well, we haven't missed by watching it, but we've missed sort of on the podcast. Talking we missed about the most important piece of news in NASCAR in a little while. In probably the last few years. Uh, while we were on vacation, Jeff Gordon decided to come out of retirement. <laughs> yeah, but why did he? That's, well, I mean, that's which one thing. is the bigger so, story? It's hard I, to say. I don't know. And it, it, I think Jeff Gordon racing again is a bigger story, to tell you the truth, because it seems like all the media and probably what I'm going to do right here is going to say, I wish Dale Jr. the best. I'm glad he is taking a a health stand in a you know in a sport uh that that has messed some other people up in the head um and uh, and i'm glad he's uh, setting an example there and of course we want him to have the speediest recovery and there is the disclaimer now we get to talk about jeff gordon you know but i i don't want to skip out no you're no no no. Uh, i mean that's what i talked with the people that i've been really engaging with on twitter that have been a lot of fun to talk to some of our some of our friends over there is that I mean, it's the worst situation you could have for a junior fan or junior himself, obviously. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, the fan being an extension of what his issues are. It's the best possible situation for everybody else to get to see Jeff run a retirement race that I think we all expected him to run at some point. Under different circumstances. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Maybe somewhere there, maybe an all-star race or something. He just decides something. to blow it up. You'd think he would have done something. Yep. And Indy being a place that is near and dear to him, having grown up racing the open-wheel outlaws and sprint cars. And then Pocono, after they talked about that, so, or after they you know figured out that it was going to be a few more races till, uh well, Junior let's, be back. I mean, let's talk about the, the most... Well, let's talk about what you got next. How about that? <laughs> I, I could have gone into it. It's a more Jeff there. Gordon. Let's keep Well, going. it was just the, the whole farewell lap that Tony Stewart asked him to do, and he didn't plan it. He asked his spotter to tell TJ Majors on the spotter stand, Yep. Hey, Jeff, key in after the, uh, the, you know, the last restart. He was like, hey, Tony wants to do some kind of thing, so just do your normal pull off the track, and then we'll figure out what he wants to do. 
Yeah. Like on the radio. And then did like the farewell lap with him. And and that goes right along with all the uh all the stuff we talk about where where Tony just doesn't want to be the center of attention so many times. Uh it's it goes along with the charity work that he does that he doesn't talk about or the randomly show up at somebody's thing that he doesn't really talk about or or you know if he's supposed to do a a lap over at Indy, he's like, "Hey, I could get Jeff Gordon in here too and uh, you know, make it fun for well, both of us." Well, here's the thing that he doesn't get loves said. Other people too. I think the thing that doesn't get said is that Jeff Gordon was Tony's inspiration, even though they basically were racing at the same time in open wheel dirt cars. Mm -hmm. Jeff Gordon was beating him until he got out and got in a stock car, and then Tony, you know, did the, was the first guy to win the Triple Crown Unify All Three Series. I think what's what's missing here is the discussion that that Tony idolized Jeff Gordon mm -hmm. uh, as a driver and as a mm -hmm. mentor. And, I mean, he didn't want to say that because he didn't want to draw any attention to it. But it's painfully obvious. Sure. When you look back. And they had they had the same path. The only difference is Gordon never, he never really drove an, an Indy car, an open-wheel asphalt car. He was roped up by Billy Ballou, I think. Said, Old Billy Ballou. Yeah, it was like, guy flew up to Indianapolis and said, you want to come drive a stock car? Yep. I'll let you in it tomorrow mm -hmm. kind of thing mm -hmm. so that's why jeff never ended up in an indie car if he had who knows what would have happened although we see tony had so much success and then eventually came to nascar because i'm sorry indie car fans nascar is a more challenging series <laughs> well, it also pays a lot better we can, we can get to that at some other time <laughs> but uh yeah well, i mean what can you say jeff gordon coming out and here's the crazy part he retired retired <laughs> with 797 starts now he has 798 after pocono he'll have 799 don't tell me he ain't gonna find number 800 somewhere right know? right i think the really astounding feat about the 797 starts was that he never missed one in between right and he was like one season away from catching the rooster for the Iron Man. yeah even with all those back issues and stuff it was yeah really nasty crashes at pocono and I saw some uh, I saw some stuff uh, from people we respect a lot, McGee, Marty Smith, other people talking about uh, you know questioning whether it's a good idea for him to come back for a few races. Uh, especially McGee was talking about well, he's uh, uh, you know the way his back is, I would just hate it to be the linchpin for something awful to happen. Um, I don't know though, just you know taking that chance and having Jeff Gordon back is is just really cool. I don't I don't know what to say. I would never accuse ryan mcgee of being a clickbaiter but i felt like when i read that that it was a truly honest article but it's as close as honesty can get to clickbait just trying to offer well I, or trying to offer up a well but as a opinion. contrarian like i respect I, it yeah, yeah yeah exactly like i'm naturally a contrarian myself i respect that he decided to go outside a competition and talk about humans mm -hmm. human life and not not a matter of life and death. That's not what we're talking about. We're what we're talking about is Jeff Gordon basically quit racing because his back was so bad, and at times people had to help him get off the couch. Right. And uh, and his kids are getting to the age where they're they know everything that's going on, and he wanted to be a part of that. So the worst thing that could come of this is Jeff to have some kind of debilitating injury come from a crash. That now he can't live the life that he retired to do. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, so that that, that I mean, I like that. I said, I have a lot of respect for Ryan and what he writes, and that it always is in the right spot. It just had that feel, well, a little bit of a hook, I like, which is probably I what like he's supposed to do. Other, I like seeing the other side, where so many of us were were celebrating it, that it was good to see somebody say, "Hey, you might think about this." I mean, oh, okay, I'll think about that. Oh, I still like it. <laughs> so, you know, I I get it because, like you said, it's a, it's on a personal level. So anyway, uh, we don't have to we don't have to dwell on that. But Jeff Gordon's back, <laughs> and, and we get to watch him next weekend, which is cool. Yep, which yep. we'll get to in the gassing it back in up. In the gassing it we up, gotta, for we sure. got to keep tearing it down. Though. Oh, we're gonna tear it down. Let's tear it down like Matt Kenseth tore it down at New Hampshire <laughs> <laughs> while I was 
while I was gone, uh, there was a race at New Hampshire. If you notice, though, I did not forget to start drivers. I was in the middle of wherever. No, you did great. I and, didn't uh, do. I started drivers. Failed at all our fantasy fantasy league. Yeah. <laughs> over the over this past weekend, yeah. I scored zero points in any. Oh, game. bummer! <laughs> I don't think I don't know. I I probably had hangover starters from last week. Yeah, yeah. Which may have been good or bad, for all I know. So what happened, from my understanding, after reading about it and everything, Matt Kenseth uh, ended up winning the race and then failing inspection, and fell in laser body inspection. Laser body inspection, and what was the? I mean, what was the quote unquote reason other than? cheater <laughs> well it just didn't fit the laser template mm -hmm. uh the, and i don't they don't tell you which oh, which way okay. it was skewed I got you, you almost always have to assume it's skewed to the right well, sure. oh you know what it was it wasn't they he failed the lasers but it was because of uh toe in the rear axle housing so huh. i'm assuming that they had the right, at least the right, maybe even the left, probably the right is one that caused it. Just be towed out just a little bit to get that extra drive off the corner mm -hmm. and drive straighter. Okay. Well, who knows? But so, because of that, it, it missed the lasers. So he essentially got a slap on the wrist. I know that a hundred thousand dollars. You know, you can. There's a lot of places in this country you can just go buy you a house for as much as they. Have, well, uh, but the thing is, Gibbs pays for the fine. Right, right. Kenseth so I, I'm not saying it's a it's a small because uh, there's been a lot of you know twenty five thousand dollar fines. Those, but this a hundred thousand dollar fine. And what was it, fifteen points? Fifteen points. Which I mean, he's won, so it doesn't matter. That's basically what everybody said once the penalty was posted. Is this is a no penalty penalty? Right, and so the fifteen points doesn't matter where the win. And so what what people were were asking was. Should they be taking wins away at this point? I mean, we've uh, you know they've talked about it for for a few years, but now that wins are so important, and you're willing to quote unquote cheat your way into a win, and you get no repercussions from it, what's your incentive to not cheat? Well, I think the one incentive they built in last year that made sense that NASCAR didn't deem Kansas penalty being deep enough into the penalty rule book to apply is the bonus points that go towards the win mm -hmm. when you enter the chase. Sure. They uh, didn't take those away from him. So essentially they said, we don't give a you-know-what about this type of failure. Sure. The The question that I keep asking, and you, you and I talked about this in the pre-show, and I said, we got to stop because we need to talk about this on the show, which is I, I always ask when it comes to stuff like this, what about Homestead? What about Homestead? What happens if this penalty is assessed in the last race? Or not this penalty, but something like this happens in the last race. Um, <laughs> I I don't know. If they if, if they dock him 15 points and fine him $100,000, he's still the champion. You know what I mean? And so that's, a, that's an absolute zero. So then what is your incentive to not just push things all out of whack uh, in Miami. So I got two questions. One, I legitimately don't know the answer. Um, and I didn't bother to look before because I didn't have the thought before. Do they even have post-race at Homestead? Well, I was going to ask. Because I <laughs> suspect they probably don't. And the second thing is, why do we have post-race? Like, if you're going to do all, spend all that time inspected on the front end and docking these guys practice time because they can't get through pre-race and pre-qualifying inspection, mm -hmm. why why inspect it after? Build the rule book r robust enough that you don't need post-race inspection. Well, so I think that's that's the reason why is because they, they don't have the rule book right now to a point that they can do that. And we've seen it with <laughs> even our uh, driver who, you know, they, they build a part to fail so that the car gets skewed in a certain right, way. Right, and they tell him how to tear it up yep. and then tell him how to reset it. Yep, exactly. But what I'm saying is, why not just let him do that and not post-race? <laughs> and then everybody does it, I guess, though, right? But, but in that, I mean, that's the whole PDs versus no PDs. It's like, <laughs> it is. Well, these sports were better when it was pretty obvious. <laughs> everybody was that, just... Uh, that they weren't tested for anything. Well, it was better for their health, I guess. But I, I think you, you start getting into... Uh, uh, safety issues too. If you have parts that are supposed to break or it's spilling mercury all over the track, <laughs> that sort of crap. Well, I, I mean, I agree, and obviously we're 
you know, the conversation is meant to be open and fun. Um, I just feel like the the rule book is fine for, for pre-race. I don't know why we wouldn't just say, if you want to let that part break and eventually cut your tire down, that's on you. Here's here's my thought to answer my own question, and it kind of goes along with your mine, – mine's a little more conspiracy theory. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yep, yep, I'll throw those out. It's some AM radio conspiracy theory. I think if this type of penalty or the, or the type of penalties we've seen with the parts that are supposed to break, if they find that post-race at Miami, it didn't happen. If they find that you have 10 cylinders, they're going to do something. You know, If they find that you were putting nitrous in the car, they're, they're going to do something. Right. But I, I think, think the only thing that should I think be inspected they're sweep, is drivetrain. Yeah, I think they're going to sweep right under the rug anything – that is uh, for the championship, and the championship was won, and they celebrated, and he held up the trophy and all that. That's your winner, unless something ridiculous happened that probably doesn't even need to be post-raced anyway at that point. I mean, you're not going to get 10 cylinders. I, I guess you could uh, pull a uh, Walter Racing and pour something into the gas tank. but <laughs> Maybe, maybe. Um, yeah, I, I think it just gets swept under the rug, to be honest. I think it does, too. It. I mean, I would especially the way we've seen everything else run in NASCAR, very much the – I mean, first of all, they started as felons, okay? Let's just start there. <laughs> yeah. And now we're 50 years later, and are 60. And so the sport started a certain kind of way, and so you would expect some of the ruling to be suspect. Mm -hmm. Now, where there's a lack of transparency – transparency, excuse mm. me – in the, the suspectness of the ruling is when people start to bitch. Like, well, why is this thing a problem, but that thing's not a problem? Mm -hmm. Why is this cheating and this other thing is rewarded as being innovative? It's like, well, you can't draw the line because the gray area of the rule book is where NASCAR wants the teams to pay for innovation. Yeah. And they want to tell them when they go, I don't think we like that. Yeah. That's bad. But NASCAR can't afford to, to do R&D. Not in the way the teams can. No. So they have to let them innovate, which is why there's always going to be gray rules or gray areas, I should say. Or, which is or probably why we have to have a open post to negotiation rules, like sure. the Constitution, for instance. <laughs> um, but I think it's always going to be because you have to, like, in order for the sport to survive, A, the teams have to innovate, and NASCAR can't afford to do it blanketly because that's what IROC was, pretty much. And that's why it went away. Cause IROC like, ruled. We can no longer afford to build these cars and just race them in front of 40,000 people. Yeah, that was a problem. It was just uh, you know a, a parade, not a parade, but a, a feature sort of race on Friday of race well, weekend. Well, at a place after. like Atlanta, it looked like yeah. a restrictor plate race. Yeah. But it was awesome. I still like it. I had I so much concept. fun at IROC races. And, and you'd get people from all these different series, too. That was one of the cool parts to me. Was, Hell yeah, it was only six drivers from NASCAR, I think, qualified. Yeah. It was a 14-car field. Yep, yep. So you had uh, you had some of the uh, dirt bike guys that were driving in it. You had everybody. Who cares? Hell Let's yeah, the best I think, I'm there. pretty sure uh, Jeremy McGrath drove one mm -hmm. at one point. Mm -hmm. Travis Pastrana, even before he was doing the NASCAR Pastrana, stuff, he'd jump into it. Ricky Carmichael probably Carmichael drove was dead. We watched Ricky Carmichael in one. It was fantastic. So And then you end up... Getting in a truck for a while, mm -hmm. and even uh, Xfinity Series car for a minute or two. Yeah. So anyway, so that's a nice tangent there. <laughs> that's what'll happen during this because we both got just a little bit of the ADD in us, mm -hmm. and if we hit we'll a go nerve, grandpa story, the, yeah, the we'll older go. we get. I just had a birthday, by the way, two weeks ago. So uh, I'm just a happy little birthday, bit, butthole. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm just one more toe in the grave on that so just doing my grandpa story you're one more election cycle away from being eligible unfortunately for you oh yeah yeah for yeah. A presidency Bummer. 34 years old i am so. currently eligible <laughs> i am voting for andrew sherwin for president i'm voting for me, me too <laughs> <laughs> um so uh, let's keep tearing it down one more thing to tear down here and this this was huge news to me when i saw it and i just went huge <laughs> kind of no, my cool. voice there. it was huge uh Stuart Haas going to Xfinity full time in what 2017? Yeah, heck yeah! So this is all, and, and we'll call this a little speculation, a little bit just like general NASCAR intellect. Um, they won't have to be able to rely on Hendrick anymore for uh, personnel support. 
That was a very astute observation when I read the the show notes that you had sent me, and I said, "Oh, okay, I see where they're going. Okay, I'm in. I got it." Right. So uh, they obviously have a driver they've identified. He's been in a junior motorsports truck this year which he can't drive next year because he'll be under contract by a Ford team. Mm -hmm. So they need somewhere for him to race. I'm assuming they've seen enough in the truck series to and his couple of starts in Xfinity that bringing him up is something they're uh, more than willing to do. I would say at this point... And this person is? This person is Cole Custer. Yep. Yeah, wheel man. And... I would assume that he's not going to race all the races at first because I would think they would want Kevin Harvick to get in one week and shake it down. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kurt Busch to get in one week and shake it down. Um, so either they're going to build one car and sometimes race two and Custer's going to run the full boat or Custer's only going to run a partial, like maybe yep. an 18 race deal. And they put... Clint and Kevin and Kurt and maybe even Danica at tracks that she needs to learn more about how to get on and off well, that the would gas. Be interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, to build the sponsorship necessary to maybe build an R and D car to go with it. Mm-hmm. However, they decide to do it. I don't expect Cole Custer to run 35 races and the cha- and run or 33 races and run for the championship next year. Personally, that's just an opinion though. So with us being, I mean, well over halfway into the season at this point, I thought it was another, from the, from the, I don't know, drama side of things, I thought it was another interesting example of how well SHR can keep news under wraps. Uh, Because we've talked about it before, the way that Tony Stewart does it. I mean, he even announced like... This is probably the best kept secret. This was... I mean, the Ford was obviously the best kept secret. Yeah, yeah, that was surprising. Then we hear about this like, oh, you're, you're doing it. Next year, like, huh? <laughs> right. You're already you're already switching. I mean, presumably you could run the same skeleton chassis uh-huh. with a Ford body and a Ford motor. That's kind of the way NASCAR is built today. Is that like really what we see? The only difference we really see is from the front clip forward and and the back bumper piece mm-hmm. that matches the stock. Well, they buy them off of each other too. I mean, we you know. Right. Well, and they, I mean, those parts are all pressed for everybody. Like mm-hmm. everybody buys, everybody in Ford buys their new pressed autoclaved Kevlar f- nose piece from the same person. Yep. That's what helps make it economical. You couldn't have five or six of those guys competing to only build maybe a hundred in an entire year. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know they're expensive, but they're not that friggin' expensive. <laughs> so it'll be cool because that's going to be another, I think it'll be a competitive team. Too. I think they will, too. I think they immediately will. I think if both Stuart Haas, and that's Tony Stewart and Gene Haas, and Roger Penske have a half a brain on them, they're like, hey, uh, you know that thing y'all had with Hendrick? Yeah. Let's Because they've already got that. crews, too. They could they could just put together yeah. two or yeah, three I of mean, the guys I think, from each of the guys the crew. I think a couple of the Stuart Haas crews were, uh, were Hendrick bench crews. Mm-hmm. Or or development crews, you know the combine. They, yeah, yeah. They have like eight pit teams, and they only use <laughs> yeah, like six. Or, There's two yeah. of them that are like are employed, but like are the two deep. Yeah, yeah. The bench <laughs> players. I love it. I love it. So yeah, I'm I'm excited about that. Looking forward to it. And like I said, I, I think they'll be competitive. So uh, that'll be neat. That gets us to um, fan questions. Fan questions. Fan questions. Fan questions. Fan questions. Yep. We need to uh, lift that directly from Fighter and the Kid, which is <laughs> another great podcast. For sure. So, uh, at 42 underscore updates, uh, Kyle Larson updates, uh, asks us, what do we think about heat racing on Sundays with inverted fields post qualifying? <laughs> okay. So, I'll add a little bit to that because I didn't want to type forever. The other thing that he wanted to interject was that the weekend's too long and the cup teams, as good as they are with engineering, get too much practice. He wants to practice for 60 minutes on Saturday and race like a 20 or a 15-mile heat race, a couple of them obviously, to set the field 
and then like a hundred lap feature or a hundred mile feature, depending on which track. In cup. In cup. <laughs> which I didn't know how. I didn't know. I thought we might align on this. I think you know where I stand on this. It's like I understand the excitement, and obviously they they're going to. Inv- so his idea is you invert the start. I don't know if you invert. Maybe you invert to twenty five positions. Maybe you invert all 40. I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that would work for sponsorship is the thing I think about is, you know, if my guy ran the fastest in practice and he qualified up front, why has he got to start 20th? Because mm-hmm. he's not going to get TV exposure. So that's the one thing I think is a knock on the idea. But the other thing is related to that is, was Bob Pockers tweeted today, and I was so glad for him to do it because I've been blocked by so many jerks <laughs> for saying it. Because they're like, that's bull spit. Is the TV dollar matters more than the ticket sales for NASCAR? Sure. So it's not it's not necessarily about putting fans in the stands. It's about putting eyeballs on the television. Well, the second part of that tweet was. Fans in the stands have a lot to do with sponsorship, too. It's hard to get right. sponsors. It with, is cyclical. There is yeah. a triangle. Yep. Yeah. If if a sponsor perceives the sport as undesirable by looking at empty stands, mm-hmm. it's harder to sell them on the idea that, yeah, but our TV partnership. Yeah, yeah. Or your sponsor goes up to, uh, you know, your sponsor goes out to the track. That's what the sponsors do. They go out to the track, and they're meeting people and hanging out. If there's 50,000 people there at a 250,000-person track it doesn't look good yeah that that you're just not seeing anybody you're not talking your reps come back to you and you say i didn't see anybody you know I, we talked to like 20 people and they're like well why are we spending three and a half million dollars to get 20 yeah, people what's to, our yeah yeah reach there this doesn't so appear here's uh here's my problem with with this uh idea it says what do we think about heat racing on sundays with inverted field post qualifying Here's the thing. We've been we've been asking for a weeknight race. We've been asking for midweek sort of something. Run me one race midweek like we do with Eldora, but run it in cup on some short track somewhere and do exactly this and have it points. Make it a points race. And make Hell it yeah, a, you do a it wild at, card points race you midweek do it at doing this. Hell yes. You do it at Hickory or you do it at Bowman Gray so the teams don't have to travel. Yep. And you make it points. Yep. And you make it to where not all 40 qual- uh, forty cars qualify for the feature. Yep. <clears throat> and and you make it, and it's one race. And just like a, a freaking race at Talladega or Daytona, oh, well, they lucked up and blah, blah, blocked really good and won a race. I'm like, well, I mean, what's Daytona? Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> why not? It yep. would be awesome as hell. Yep. So, so my, my only problem with this comment right now is the word Sundays. It can't be on Sunday. Let's do it midweek, and let's do let's do something a little. It's got to be a two Look, and a half hour night show. I already said it. Look at Eldora, and we haven't even talked about that yet while we were gone. No, we and I'm, we're not talking about dirt, y'all. We're still talking about asphalt cars. They yep, can still yep. use their Martinsville car mm-hmm. or whatever, and they really don't have to build a special car unless they just want to. So that's the way you do it. If you're going to do a heat race, now, but I think this guy's talking like the whole schedule, which is see for me, it's a, not going to work for NASCAR. Race, uh, yeah, yeah, and and that, I mean that's such a radical change that you just can't do that over now. That's uh, imagine that's, how many commercials we'd have if a cup race only <laughs> was two hours. Yeah, yeah, they would stretch it out to four. And I mean, that's be, part of the reason why they're long to begin with, and that's yeah. how they've sold the marketing packages. Is Hey, we're on air for like three and a half hours. Yeah, you're talking about changing NASCAR. I mean, fundamentally changing what the series is, what it means, what types of drivers are going to do well. What you know, you're fundamentally changing the entire thing. But I'm I'm not talking about a fundamental change. Let's do this once. Let's do this somewhere. It's kind of like saying, what if we ran trucks only on dirt? No, I'm not into that. What no. if we ran this one Eldora race, Tony Stewart owned track? Uh, so you know he's going to take care of it, and you know he's going to represent well and all that. Hell yes. And look at where it is. It's awesome. Right. So, Did it just set a record for the highest attendance at a dirt track? <laughs> probably. Or a world, I think it set a Guinness record huh. for highest attendance wow. at a dirt track. Like 55,000 people there. Yeah. Or yeah. More than Indy. There was 50,000 <laughs> people there for sure. And exactly. Let's not take these things that are anomalies 
and try to turn them into widespread. And one of the things I listened to, I don't know if you've got the door bumper clear or not, but one of the things TJ Majors and Spotter Brett, Brett Griffin, were adamant about is that the idea of doing a heat race for the Dash for Cash was not a bad idea. Mm -hmm. What was a bad idea was how they went about it. Well, and doing it at Indy. Um, well, where it's the tracks they chose and the fact that you couldn't go to a backup car if you wrecked. So what the heck was the heat race for? That's parade. Yeah. You know, and yep. Brett said exactly. we had two green flag passes started. in eight heat races. Jeez. Between the four tracks, there was two green flag passes. Passes for the lead? For the lead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what what did we do? Yeah. We had a great idea, but we flubbed the rules. Yeah, well, they they need to they need to work on the rules then. Yeah, and I I think that if they're trying to emulate a that short track feel, they need to they need to go all in. It and I be know bring a short track. I, well, yeah, well that to start. It doesn't Indy, need to be are you absolutely everybody out knew, of your mind? Everybody knew Indy when they announced it was going to be silly, and then it was silly, and then uh, you know who's who's I don't know. Anyway, but they they need to uh, they need to go all in with this. Uh, which is if you don't if you don't qualify up front, and I know sponsorship and blah 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 blah, blah and I know the small teams, and we've had small drivers on this uh, small time drivers on the podcast too. But hey, if you don't make it, you don't get in the show. I think that's part of it too. Well, that's certainly a part of weekend racing. Yep. You know, especially the really popular weekend, you know, race tracks. It used to be very much a part of NASCAR. I mean, there was. When we first started watching this sport, and we're not in it very long, y'all, as you probably already guessed, maybe about 12 years or so that we've really been paying attention, um, there used to be, in, in the beginning when we started watching, there used to be four, five, six cars that would go home at every track. Mm -hmm. There might be 15 cars go home at Daytona and Talladega. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I remember a 61 car entry list for Daytona one year mm -hmm. for the 500, so it's... You know, it's hard to balance this stuff. Nor you want to attract as many players as possible, and so the rules package and the process has to support that. But at the same time, they're stuck in this weird, like rolling ball, the down, the snowball mm -hmm. of the TV relationship versus the fan attendance and the activation of the track and all that stuff. Yeah. So. I think we've answered the question as best as we can. Let's let's go to the next question. Our next question comes from at MRJ2626619. Uh, M. Johnson on Twitter. He says, why has attendance been so low this year? Before just, you answer. Okay. Did you bring another beer up with you? I didn't. Oh, okay. Never mind. I'll just, uh, I'll just go drive for a little bit. slug that. I, I, I feel like I've been How talking. How far in are we? I must have been talking too much. Uh, 40 minutes or so. It's oh all good. wow! You might have to go get you something. I no, might it's have all to good. find a topic. It's all good. Go ahead. Uh, why has <laughs> attendance been so low this year? And I actually have. So I think the last two them. words were unnecessary <laughs> because I don't think this year Still some your drink is well. Then I'm going to have to go get it. <laughs> <laughs> this year is is a superlative that's unneeded uh, because this is what NASCAR has been for probably half a decade, really. Yeah. At, yeah. At, I mean, depending at on which track you look years. at. Yeah. I mean, tracks have been pulling bleachers out for a good four or five years now. Mm -hmm. um, you're just, I think what's happening is the folks, folks are noticing when it happens in their, at their place. Like I saw an aerial shot of Richmond where the entire back street, back straight bleachers have been removed. We just yep. experienced showing up Atlanta and the Atlanta. Elliott grandstand was oh, gone. Yeah. And it was weird. And it was like, like, what in the hell is <laughs> yeah, going on what's over there? going on with this? track you know, i didn't they know they did it at charlotte they pulled down the turn two bleachers yep, and they're doing all this work at daytona um they shrunk daytona by 50 something thousand seats um you know you're not going to see it in indy because well the open wheel race there is oh, it, they had three hundred thousand people at a three hundred fifty thousand people, people person there. yeah stadium but standing room but you are going to be seeing it everywhere else you know, so dover was the first one i think you and i really noticed where it was like Hey man, you got like forty percent of your bleachers covered with tarps. 
right, and advertisements. Right. Well, and those tarps are just, I mean, that's just banners of embarrassment, it, it feels like. You know? Right, it's, it's not like, advertisement. We're not even trying to sell like, this section, which is tough. Um, Bob Pockris, we've already <laughs> talked about him once, but he posted a tweet that he had a, a piece of information in there that I had not thought of prior, and that it, it didn't take me by surprise, but it, it was a new piece of information for me. Because uh, we uh, everybody's talked about, well, it's too expensive. Um, it, it is no longer the fad that it was uh, for a little while in like the 2004 era, really when we got started following the series. But he said uh, one of the points out of, out of maybe five points that he made, the last point that he made, he said there is less of a car culture today than there has been maybe in the last decade you know a decade prior or back in the 70s especially or maybe into the 90s maybe this is a cyclical thing i don't know uh because think of the 80s where we had all this awful we had a bunch cars. of really crappy cars <laughs> but uh but right now we actually uh, the thing that's surprising to me our production cars our, our cars coming off the line are pretty beefy right now i mean you're talking about uh, uh you know 450 power horsepower infinity that's coming off the line you know uh it's so I don't I I really that that <laughs> I, I'm mincing words there or messing words up, but that that really struck a chord with me that okay the the car culture just isn't as strong as it uh, as it has been in the last you know uh, or maybe in ten years ago. I thought that was an interesting point. Well, I it is and it isn't to me because cars haven't been easy to work on since the eighties, since prior to fuel injection. Mm -hmm. So I think you had people that grew up in the 60s and 70s and 80s, and they had kids in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. The kids born in the 80s probably had a chance to look at the inside of a car and maybe turn a wrench or two and understand what's going on. Yeah, I mean, you give me a couple wrenches and a screwdriver, and I'll figure out a carburetor. Right. I can't but, do that with a fuel injector. I'd be too scared. Well, I'd there's break a, a $400 piece. Right. There's a computer, and you just can't. So there's that that's stacked against us. Um, the fact that NASCAR's underlying motivational line has been we've been alienating our historical fans or our aging fan base is being alienated. Well, I mean, that's, a, that's called progress. Like, if they're being alienated, it's because they're not adjusting. Mm -hmm. You know? Show me a guy that was an NFL fan in the 70s, 80s, and 90s and said, I'm not going to watch anymore because the helmet technology is so good and we've eliminated brain-to-brain -brain gorilla monkey smashing each other. Yeah. I bet that, I, I I bet that is a very yeah, that's narrow a, sliver. That's a thin margin of people, for sure. But I would suspect that that sliver grows quite a bit with NASCAR for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. I think mostly mostly it's because there's so few people involved. We talk about how NASCAR, there's 40 guys out there running around the track at the same time. We have 40 teams running at the same time. One NFL team has as many competitors on it as most entire garages, like like the Hendrick Garage, for instance. They have 450 employees. That's a lot. But, like... A 63-man roster, including the practice guys, and then 9 to 11 coaches. Like, there's 70 competitors on a NFL team. Yeah. I'll tell you what, and, and to continue answering the question here, maybe with another question, uh, we saw Indy, uh, or the Indy 500, like we said, sold out, plus, uh, you know, there had to be 50,000 more people there that that were at the track or, or didn't go in. I mean, they sold the thing out. Quarter million people. Uh, we talked about it on here. One out of every what was it? Hundred? No, one out of every thousand. One of every two thousand people, people was there in or the was U.S. It 1, every yeah. one out of every one thousand people yeah, in one the out U.S. Every one thousand was at that race. Uh, just incredible numbers when you start thinking about it. My question is: Had NASCAR given away all tickets for free, would they have filled the stadium? I don't know that I don't think they would have filled it. No. I don't think they would have either and that is that's a rough realization to kind of come to. I think so much like we saw <clears throat> baseball fall from favor and become number 2 and then number 3 
in terms of American sports and the pastimes. And baseball really never recovered. Now, there could be a whole bunch of extraneous reasons for that, but the strike in 94 is what is was the catalyst for the big change mm-hmm. for NFL to go flying by and just stay gone. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, like I said, there could be a myriad of other reasons why, but that was the catalyst. Mm-hmm. Baseball, if baseball was getting 40 million views a night, well, it still might, actually, if you go market to market. But um, I think the tire issue in 2008 at Indy, like, people were already ready for the Indy race to stop being boring. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you had to yellow flag every 12 laps Mm -hmm. for an entire race. And that race had... A boatload. <laughs> I almost said an ish load, but the an wrong one. Ish load. And an ish load of people <laughs> at it. A very appropriate crowd. And we basically haven't seen anything like that since. Mm-hmm. I think enough people were just like, you know what? Between all the stuff that's going on, and now you did this to Indy, my beloved track, I'm out. I'm done. Couple that with the exact same time the economy was diving. Yep. yep. And so there's been a lot of uh, articles about it. I know uh, Matt Weaver at Matt Weaver SBN, who uh, he's uh, been on the show with us before. He wrote a, a really good article on some suggestions there uh, and how to make the weekend read those. Uh, better. And I encourage all y'all to go out and read those. Uh, I'm not going to repeat his comments here, but um, uh, there's been a lot of a lot of talk about that and how to get more you know butts in the seats. And we we talk about that with every single uh, guest that we have on here. Uh, uh, about that's one of our questions yep is like yep. if there's one thing about nascar you would change and how do you think we could get more people to come it's a challenge it's obvious yep yep so let's um let's gas it up all right we're you starting ready to gas it up yeah i am we got tricky triangle part du part du du going back for the second time oh, Mila. Oh. um yeah what can you say oh and you added something there i hadn't seen cool Oh, yeah. Uh, I did, because uh, I knew we were going to have to do picks. <laughs> but um, uh, at the Tricky Triangle, this was, uh, what, Kurt Busch's race back, what, six weeks ago? <laughs> Whatever it was. Was it even that? Yeah. I yeah, mean, even that? <laughs> yeah, six weeks might happen Sunday. Like, yeah. we go six yeah, weeks we door to door. So, um, <laughs> back at Pocono, I... I f- it feels uh, like you just said. It feels like we just talked about it. So it's like, well, what do we talk about now, other than who we're picking? Um, well, other than that, it's such a unique track. It's very high on our bucket list, absolutely. Uh, and we've already got Rob Pines tell us <laughs> that he's willing to. Uh, or excuse oh, me, Deputy Rob Hines. Hines. My Deputy bad. Hines. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking of of somebody else, but yeah, he's offered to come get us from the airport and take us to the racetrack whenever we want to go so next year <laughs> might have to we're be in, higher up the I list. Mean, uh, <laughs> I, I think there he year, is yep. <laughs> sorry for screwing your there. name up bud <laughs> <laughs> you're on the periscope giving us ish if you will uh, get on up there man next year I, I feel like we we almost have to let's start let's start making some picks you ready to make some picks here comes yeah. our guy yeah you go ahead <laughs> Yeah, that's our that's our picks guy. Obviously, uh, here's <laughs> here's my thing. Uh, I how many more times am I going to be able to do this? The '88 car uh, had second place in June. Uh, you know, six weeks ago, the '88 car placed second. That means this car is strong. They know what car to bring. They now know what driver they're bringing. They're bringing Jeff Mother Flipping Gordon, who is a is a Pocono God. And, it, and the 88 car, the team, just swept Pocono two years ago So before how, LeTart went to the booth. How in the NASCAR fandom and I'm, am I not supposed to pick the 88? And if you do it, I, I don't even give a crap. No, I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. But I, it feels like, yeah, you're making the right decision, I think. <laughs> Is uh, it from the heart? Hell yes, it is. Well, is I, it, I, I'm, I'm glad you chose 88 because I'm going have, a different direction. Okay. And I'm going to beat the same old horse and play the same <laughs> old broken record. I'm going with a 24, man. <laughs> this feels like the place where a rookie can win. It's really funny. That's and really he led like 20, 
five laps there last I'm going with the six weeks ago or whatever. Of Jeff Gordon, and you're going with the 24 of not Jeff Gordon, and this which is, is like, what bizarre world are we This is completely coincidental. <laughs> there is no relation. I I made my decision today that I was going to pick <laughs> Chase unless you took him. Yeah, yeah. And I had no idea that you had put in this little note about the 88 car finish in second <laughs> last race. Until I got here, because you added it yeah, yeah, I added after it. I sent you my notes. So, <laughs> this is independent of each other. This is how aligned we are on thought a lot of times. <laughs> so, we're basically picking the tw- the drivers of the 24 car. Well, the no, drivers of the 24 car. And a note that, yeah, right? <laughs> uh, at least the last two drivers of the 24 car in the last 20 years. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Uh, you you would actually put a note here, Chase Elliott, Chase Elliott and Ryan Blaney, but uh, you know just struggling a little bit lately. I you said struggling or bad luck. I I'm gonna say bad luck more than anything. I'm gonna say bad luck too, and that's yep. been my commentary on the Twitter boxes. Hey man, it's not like they're they're not wrecking running 35th, right? They're wrecking trying to get 10th. Yeah. Casey Kane is struggling. <laughs> Casey Kane is struggling. <laughs> yes. Chase Elliott is not struggling. Yeah. He's he's it's absolutely bad luck. Yeah. Uh one of these guys or both of them's gonna win a race. Obviously I feel strongly about that because I picked Chase this week and we don't have anything on the line except for who picks first next week. Yeah. So and that's not a dark horse. I'll pick a dark horse. Do you want to pick a dark horse? I kinda wanna pick Jeff Gordon as my dark horse. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Which car number is he driving? Though? Uh, who knows? Oh, uh, so you're going 88 squared? <laughs> yeah, 88 squared. <laughs> uh, I feel like it would be remiss not to. Well, a dark horse wouldn't be an SHR car. <laughs> so maybe we'll I just mean, call you, it are, a, are you going to pick Danica as dark horse? No. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> maybe a dark horse for a top ten. You know what? I like what I'm reading right there. I'm going to. Well, I'm going to go all Hendrick this weekend, and go. I think the five is a dark horse in terms of this season and performance. It's not a dark horse at Pocono if he gets the right car. It's won there twice in two different models. Sure. And, and I mean, the, the pressure's starting to build on him. I mean, he's got to – he's, what, just barely in or barely out of the he's bubble right now. He's been towing the line every week. Yep. Uh, and all it takes, really, because there is a large margin between – because he's like eight points and, like, Dinger is like seven points – and then the next person's like thirty five points. In other words, there, there's a out out of out of whatever the next place is or whatever right. it is. So there's there's a margin there. There's like a race and a half. Yeah, and and you know, unfortunately for those guys, it takes one other guy winning for for now. That margin is not even in well, the bubble. Anymore. I mean, that's what we talked so about with win. Tony. I don't know. Did we talk about it? We, I don't know if we got to talk about it on the show or not. It doesn't matter, but. Yeah, that's a huge deal. Knowing that Tony was going to get in the top 30, his win Mm -hmm. really, really closed. I mean, that really slammed the door for one one of those five drivers fighting for the last two positions. Maybe it's even seven drivers fighting for the last two positions. You've got Blaney and Chase and Dinger and and Paul Menard and Casey and I think Austin Dillon's in that same bubble. He might be in right now, but has kind of been bouncing in and out. Tony winning was, was... crucial to yeah. that situation yeah yeah it just goes to show how much that that win means and that, you know that nascar did what they and they that's one of the things people have been mentioning about they're flipping out about the fact that you could <laughs> what does this start the right you know start the season halfway in win a race all of a sudden you're in top 30 and now you're in that's why i said why don't we move it to top 25 or i, I mean whatever at this point hey I, mean, I don't hate the way it is but i don't hate it at that point if, if it has to be this way then i'm not going to hate that outcome of it. I don't know how to put that. I don't know how to say that. Yeah. Well, what I would say is if we look at what Cobb did last year and where he ended up in points before the chase started, and we look at Tony this year, assuming he continues to perform well. And if we take a look at that and it looks closer to like 25, then let's adjust it to 25. Yeah. Because I think they probably both would. I think Kyle did for sure win in all those races. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I think I he got all the way to like twenty third. I think. Yeah, I mean, they shoot. They might. <laughs> they'd still give exemption. How are you not going to give Tony an exemption? This well, year? I, I'm not <laughs> arguing about the Tony. Although thing. I said I didn't think they would do it if you run back the PETM podcast, but uh, that was a different time and a different, different time mood, and a different <laughs> different bat place, and yeah, a different bat yeah. time. Here's an interesting stat for you: They have never 
declined anybody an exemption waiver ever in the history of exemption waivers thus far. That's right, because Denny got one for his eyeball. That mm-hmm. was like the first one. Mm-hmm. Because they, he actually had to start the race, and then he got out at was it Bristol? Because it rained, and then his no, that was when his neck got jacked up. He actually sat a whole race out because he got metal in his eye, and I can't. That was three or four years ago. Yeah, whatever it was. But they they it have didn't. not declined an. Uh, they gave him the exemption. Yeah, they have not declined an exemption yet. So until they do, I don't see you know. And and John West Townley's fixing to come back. Um. Right, his brain's fixed. Yep, he's coming back. Yep, probably going to be in the ARCA and the trucks race. Yep, so if I'm sure him. he'll have the same because he was running know, for the ARCA championship. He was yep. in the hunt. Well, let's quit boring people. Let's close this thing out. You ready to do it? Okay. Well, you know how uh, how we do close this thing out. That's with the beer flavored jelly bean challenge. Try not to eat all of them. Sherwin's got <laughs> a few in his mouth there. I'm going to stuff a few in here. All right, I'm going to try to answer the, some of these Periscope questions that I remembered. We're going to be at Bristol on Friday afternoon. Oh, yeah. We usually get there about 2.30 or 3 o'clock, somewhere around in there. Both take the day off work, so we just oh, get yeah. up and go. We get up and go. We get to Asheville, get some uh, craft fruit. I know somebody great. said, what well, we're going to be drinking at Bristol. It's going to be some mixture of craft brew and uh, and Miller Lights and, uh, and bourbon. For sure. And uh, somebody said, do we like Coors Light? I'm like, well, you got Coors Light in your fridge. I think I got one in mine. Sure that do. tells you all you need to know. I sure do. On that one. Um, Pocono, man. Pocono. I wonder if them marmots will get out on the track. <laughs> Mess my car up. It'll be funny. Y'all, you know where to follow us. PTMPodcast.com, at PTMPodcast on Twitter. Uh, we're on the Instagram, we're on the Snapchat, we're on all that crap. We are on all the crap. <laughs> I've always, uh, or as always, I'm Tailgate Mayor, Rusty Wallace, at Tailgate Mayor. I'm Andrew Sherwin, at Pregame ENG. Talk to y'all next week. Thumbs up! <laughs>